Yeah. Okay. Good. Good morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you virtually to the fourth and our lecture in medical uh, leadership. The lectureship is called Doctors Coy, D and Rachel Fitch, uh, and our lecture in medical leadership. This is the fourth time we are hosting it. It's uh, for the first time it's being held virtually. It should have been held in 2020 for the obvious uh, reason. We have postponed it to 2021. And next slide, please. Okay. And uh, it's my pleasure to have uh, Dr. Ruslin Menon as our speaker. And uh, we have a fascinating topic, navigating success as a woman in academic medicine, a perspective. Next one. Uh, here is a beautiful picture of uh, Dr. Fitch and uh, Dr. Rachel Fitch. So D Dr. Fitch inspired generations of physicians during his 33 year tenure at St. Louis University School of Medicine. His service to St. Louis University began in 1967 as an associate professor of internal medicine and biochemistry. He had a laser-like focus on growing the Department of Internal Medicine into one of the premier programs in the nation. And his vision for the department centered on providing superior care and treating patients with respect. Dr. Uh, Fitch uh, recruited uh, some of our iconic division directors like Dr. Bacon, um, um, Dr. Morley, uh, Kevin Martin, and he brought in Dr. Eaton Dibishelli from NIH. And his legacy continues due to those uh, recruitment. And he also recruited Dr. Bob Belshke for infectious disease. And uh, early in his career at St. Louis University, Dr. Fitch established the Division of Endocrinology. And he was our chair uh, from uh, 1985 to 2000. And I had the pleasure of uh, rotating with him for an entire month as a second year resident. And it's a uh, memorable mo month for me. Uh, for the rest of my life. And um, Dr. Rachel Fitch and uh, Dr. Koi Fitch had common interest in improving the practice of healthcare, increasing its availability. Dr. F uh, Rachel Fitch spent many years working through the political systems at state and national levels to establish health policies to improve access to healthcare for all individuals at socioeconomic levels. The next one. Dr. Rachel Fitch actually took this picture, and uh, I will never forget this picture. Dr. Uh, Koi Fitch um, se sent me this picture in January. I had presented this in October at a regional ACP conference in Lake of Ozarks. And here I am explaining my poster. And uh, in case my residents cannot recognize this picture, that's me with some hair there. Okay. And, and Dr. Fitch actually autographed the picture on the on the back. So I would like to thank entire uh, Dr. Fitch family. And this was a, in a September 2018, we took this picture. And um, here we have uh, uh, doc, uh, uh, thanks to Julia Fitch Brown, Robert Brown, uh, Jacqueline uh, Fitch Flackenstein, James Flackenstein, and the granddaughters. The lectureship has been made possible through the generosity of the Fitch family, as well as many family and friends of Drs. Coy and Rachel Fitch. Several individuals have contributed to honor the Fitch legacy. And I have, I'm proud to announce that due to the contributions of so many, this uh, endowed lectureship has reached the, uh, this lectureship has reached the endowment level and will live on in perpetuity within the Department of Internal Medicine. And I would like to thank Dr. Crystal Lentine for taking the lead in organizing the, uh, the fourth and our uh, lectureship uh, meeting. And uh, we had the pleasure of Dr. Menon uh, spending time with our uh, female trainees and faculty yesterday. And uh, thanks to Dr. Lentine, and I welcome her to the virtual podium to introduce Dr. Menon. So thank you, Dr. Nayak, and I'm deeply honored to introduce our invited speaker this morning for what I consider to be one of the most important Grand Rounds of the year. 
I also want to thank all attendees, including guests from across the country who have joined this event, and again, to thank the Fitch family for their support. When Dr. Nyack gave me the opportunity to recruit a speaker to reflect on career development for women in medicine, I had no hesitation in my first choice. And as the lecture progresses, you'll certainly understand why. Dr. Rosalind Mannon is Professor of Medicine, Vice Chair of Academic Development and Research Mentoring, and Associate Chief of Nephrology Research at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And Ross has been in Nebraska for just over a year after relocating with her husband to start a new journey in their collective careers. Next slide. Ross was introduced to medicine at an early age as her father was a physician and her mother was a nurse in New York City. And after her time as a young scholar in New York, she went on to undergraduate studies at Johns Hopkins and medical school at Duke. She joined the Duke faculty for seven years, followed by eight years as medical director of transplantation at the NIH, leading a translational research program in transplant immunology. Next slide. Dr. Mannon then moved to the University of Alabama where she had a highly productive tenure, including serving as Director of Research and Endowed Chair in Transplant Clinical Research, and as Section Chief at the end of her time at UAB. And with, with regard to local pride, it's fun for me to note that Roz's longtime colleague and former Chief at UAB, Dr. Robert Gaston, is a Missouri native, a SLU alumnus, and notably was a mentee and friend of Dr. Fitch. And it was an honor to visit UAB a couple of years ago and bring Bob some Billiken souvenirs. And some of Raza's esteemed UAB colleagues and former fellows, such as Dr. Vinita Kumar and Ben Hippen, have logged on this morning. Next slide. So Raza's impact includes high-level leadership roles on the professional societies. She has deep involvement in the American Society of Transplantation and served as president in 2012. She is current chair of the American Society of Nephrology Policy Committee, leading volunteer input on legislative issues in the kidney space. And her translational work directly shapes therapies and improve patient care. And as one example, she led a transplant therapeutics consortium centered on public-private partnerships to streamline the development of innovative treatments in transplant medicine. Next slide. Dr. Mannon is a prolific researcher with a robust history of NIH and government funding and a diverse publication portfolio. She served as editor for leading journals, including as a current deputy editor for the American Journal of Transplantation. And she also co-moderates a monthly AJT podcast wherein she shares her wit and insights in a way that makes science engaging and entertaining. Next slide. A notable dimension of Roz is her successful balance of personal and professional life. She's a devoted wife and mother and her Twitter handle, Man and Mom, conveys her priorities. Her husband, Peter, is now GI section chief at the University of Nebraska and the couple's beautiful daughters, Olivia and Ellie, are talented athletes and becoming scholars in their own right. And it's wonderful that both were able to join us this morning, even across time zones. And social media is a good place to find updates on the canine children, Paolo and Luca. Next slide. So connecting to our focus today, Roz is an impactful advocate for all forms of equity with a particular passion for mentorship of women in medicine. And I've had the privilege of collaborating with Dr. Mannon through a variety of projects, committees, and journal work over the past three years or so in the course of which she's become an invaluable source of knowledge, perspective, and support. However, I know I'm far from alone in what she means to me as Roz is considered one of the most valued role models for women in nephrology and transplantation in current practice. And I can't wait to hear what she is prepared to share with us today. So without further ado, Dr. Manon, thank you for joining us and welcome to the virtual podium. Next slide, Tim. Oh my gosh. Well, that was like um, an amazing trip and one of those opportunities that you think, will we ever get to there? 
But I, Krista, I'm grateful, uh, and Dr. Nayak, I'm grateful for this invitation, and I'm grateful to the family. I know that many families want to have in-person events, and um, even with the vaccines, there are still circumstances where most academic centers really cannot travel. Um, and I want to appreciate to the many individuals logging in today, those both at SLU and, and elsewhere, um, to come and to hear what I have to say. It, it makes me... Um, just grateful to be here. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start my slideshow because I know I probably have too many slides and you all will wanna be able to ask some questions. So Tim, you can see me appropriately, correct? Great. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful to um, be considered an academic success and to give you my insights today. And certainly as a vice chair of academic medicine, I've really had to think more and more about this area. Um, these are my conflicts of interest and disclosures. They have nothing to do with what I'm going to be discussing today and I will not be discussing off-label drug use. So briefly today, I, I'd like to cover and review the recent uh, American Association of Medical Colleges report on the state of women in academic medicine, 2018-19. It was published last year. Um, we'll talk and hit upon the barriers that are probably important for success of women in academic medical careers. And I'll point out to the men um, that are listening um, that the, many of these affect you as well, but probably not at the same magnitude. And to my colleagues of color, these um, are even more magnified, these disparities, as we'll see in a couple of slides. Um, but I'm really going to focus on the gender issue. We'll discuss the impact of COVID-19 because it has had a significant impact on women as well. And uh, we've in, a theme weaving into this will be strategies for academic development for success of all faculty. And I might allude to my own personal positives and negatives and navigating the mistakes, as, um, navigating my career, which I sometimes refer to as mistakes were made. So, uh, you know, the first off is why does diversity matter? Um, I, I think many of us are aware of the words that a diverse workforce provides top skilled individuals and that these individuals feed into, you know, in business client needs and motivations, but in medical centers, they really provide the goals of the organization. And at the very least, gender equity is, a, is, a, is an issue of human rights and social justice. And it's also been shown that having more women physicians and more women physicians in policymaking positions, such as Dr. Fitch, enhance the provision of high quality patient care. Um, and in particular, it's been shown that the patients of women clinicians have less hospital admissions, shorter visits, fewer ED visits, and a lower mortality than patients of, of male colleagues. So why is it so hard to achieve diversity? I think most of us at academic centers have policies. And I think if we, if we actually read the policy, we would realize that it's sound and reasonable. But there's often a failure to align these policies with organizational goals. And there's a lack of practical implementation. And as many of us are aware now, um, after this whole incident of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the many names that we could go on and on, there's now a recognition that something has to be done. And I think gender is part of this important issue. And I now actually see people engaging to reading what's on paper and trying to come up with plans to make things actually work. So shown here is the, is the initial slide summary of the picture of academic women, and I blocked off one to keep the big surprise, but it's important to point out that about half of applicants to medical school are women, and about half of, of graduates are women, so women are really well represented. And this number goes down a little bit in residency training, but not substantially. But I will point out that there is a diversity that's variable within, um, within specialties, and indeed, our colleagues at OBGYN are aware that 80, almost 80% 80 of the faculty are, are women. Um, similarly for pediatrics, these have been areas that have been really open to women. 60% of dermatology faculty are women. I was very intrigued to make sure that I saw what our own internal medicine subspecialties and specialties were doing, and we're up to about 40%, which is significantly up from when I trained. And then, of course, we're all familiar with these numbers here, where the surgical subspecialties like orthopedic surgery and neurosurgery are very well, very male dominated and have very few women faculty under 20%. So, you know, here's the next reveal. So we do really well early on. And then you see that the numbers of women in, as faculty members, division directors, full professors, department chairs and deans, those numbers continue to go down over time. And this is referred to in the report as the leaky pipeline that we start off 
at 50%, and yet our full professor load numbers are half of that. And, and so much of my talk will sort of talk about what happens in this transition. And if you look at it, yes, the number, and, and for this in some of the slides, I'll refer to the colors, but you have to pay attention because they tried to do this sort of as a non-sexist way. Men are in this kind of weird green and women in purple, and they'll actually switch that around a little bit later on. But this is showing you over time the percentage of faculty. And if you just pay attention to 2009 to 2018, you know, there's a, been a rise of about 5% of women faculty representation over 10 years, which is very positive and stressed in this report. And if you look here, um, we'll focus on clinical sciences between men and women this past year in 2021. These numbers are really much about the same. The MD PhD population in clinical medicine is not, it's very much dominated by men. Um, and now I want to just show you a little bit about basic science because this is kind of was, you know, here the numbers are low, significantly lower, significantly inverted, much fewer women than men on faculty in the basic sciences. And if you think we have a leaky pipeline, shown here are the pre-doctoral student enrollment where women dominate men, two thirds to one third showed here. Uh, and this is the first year the AAMC actually did a basic science report. But in the transition from pre-doctoral to post-doctoral positions, this gets flipped significantly. And so the numbers of women um, are now starting to go down that there are about uh, less than 50% of women are basic scientists. And that gets you down to basic science faculty. Well, only about a third, a little bit over a third of basic science faculty are women, even though we start out at two thirds as pre-doctoral students. So how does this happen? There are several components to understanding faculty composition, and I don't purport to be an entire expert, but I've been studying this problem uh, significantly. And this is true for all faculty. There is an issue of faculty retention, which relates to a couple of components like financial compensation and recognition. The significant issue of faculty promotion, which drives many of us to make sure that we're on track. And finally, faculty recruitment, which is an important component in terms of either fulfilling unmet needs or creating new needs. So when we look at uh, recruitment and retention, new hires are now purple, but this is women's recruitment and women's retention. You can see that the number is yes, there has been more recruits up about 6%, but the departures of women faculty are matching that. So we still have this gap between recruitment and retention that you know, if we continue this way over the next 10 years, we'll still not have enough women in depending on recruitment because a considerable issue continues to be retention of faculty, women faculty. So why do people leave? And, and there's not really great data. I've looked into this. A lot of this is based on exit interviews, and those are usually colored by the people that are either super happy or super unhappy. Um, and so I kind of pose this as being either dissatisfaction with your current position or finding a more attractive position and relates to a number of factors. It may relate to an improved salary, uh, better benefits. It might be a better institution, either a better institution for you or one that you perceive has more prestige. Um, you may actually get a better change in your expected duties, less clinic, less on-call time. Maybe it's a better situation for your spouse, as is, was in my case. It was really a terrific opportunity. There may be better support for your family. You're living closer to family. And then a concept that I call more love. That's many times I note that faculty just don't feel the love. They don't feel the appreciation of their colleagues or their senior leadership. Um, and that often is a driver to sort of have self-doubt and start to thinking, well, maybe I'll get it better. And certainly a recruiting process can add to that love because you're wined and dined. So let's look a little bit at the distribution of women faculty. And I added the 2020 numbers as a colleague provided to me. If you look at it across all medical centers in the country, about 60% of all instructor positions are filled by women. And these numbers go down over time that 47% or 50, about a little under 50% of faculty right now of, of assistant professors are women. And then only 40% of associate professors are women. And then we fall to 27% of full professors are women in the entire country across all departments. And I think that this is imp an improvement over time, significantly over 10 years. But I guess it's just continuing to be disheartening that when I think about that, I'm only one of 27% of women in the country in academic medicine. Um, it's, it's disturbing to try to understand this whole process. Um, these issues are even more um, prominent in uh, individuals. Uh, the AAMC calls them underrepresented in medicine. These are colleagues of color. 
uh, Caucasians are shown here in purple and, and the other ethnicities shown in other colors. And you can see that the vast majority of women, full professors are women or Caucasian or white, um, and that the distribution of individuals of color for women um, in both associate and assist and full professors are much lower. There's the distribution is a little bit more even and the lower positions such as instructor, which is non-tenure earning, and then in assistant professors as well. So similar issues, but probably more magnified. So this is really a complicated slide and I, I, I hope that I can explain it well. I'll recommend that you look at the bottom panel as a clinician, if you wanna look at the upper panel, I'll refer to it for basic science. But this really looks at promotion rates for associate to full professor for men and women and for assistant to associate professor for men and women in the lower panels for clinical. And you can see that in, in, inevitably men exceed the percentage of women being promoted shown here in the purple, 28 versus 23 uh, and 23 versus 15%. And when these individuals don't get promoted, you can see that these individuals leave, that the numbers for men and women at the associate professor level are even, but there's a significant departure of both men and women academics when they don't get promoted to associate professor. So um, there really are two components here. We have individuals that are not getting promoted, and then we're unable to retain those individuals in careers in academia. Likewise, um, basic sciences have the same issues. These are arranged in the same fashion. Um, a disproportionate percentage of men versus women are being promoted to these levels. And a very significant number of both men and women in, in PH, that are PhD scientists that are exiting um, very early in their careers. Um, these individuals, private practice perhaps, consulting, industry, uh, these more than likely uh, similarly uh, industry positions. And this was highlighted in a very recent paper in the New England Journal a couple of months ago. This was a, a major, you know, in 2000, there was this big cohort study. And I was actually, I think, part of this cohort because I graduated in, in uh, 81. But this study really highlighted over 600,000 individuals that graduated from 79 to 2013. They actually compared both cohorts. But I think the punchline here is that there are actually hazard ratios of, of women to men that are actually promoted. So the hazard ratio for associate professor is 0.76 full processor 0.77 and, and significantly lower for the likelihood of any of those graduates becoming department chair compared to men. Um, and also these graphs down here, these, these Kaplan-Meier survival curves, I never thought cumulative probability of promotion would be a survival, but here women are shown in red and men in blue. And you can see that women continue to lag and they continue to lag in the time for promotion. So for promotion to associate professor, like 2,100 days for men and about um, 2,900 days for women and a little bit shorter here. I think these lines line up more. And I think this is because by this point, you know, we're kind of like survivors. But really over the 35 years of this paper that, of these graduates, women still are less likely than men to be promoted. So why is there a promotion gap? And this has been explored in this and many other papers. Um, the notion that there is a lack of sex parity in leadership, and it is referred to as the old boy network in this New England Journal paper, although I have avoided that connotation living, having lived in the deep south. But there are significant impacts to women's productivity, and I think it's a fact that there's a disproportionate uh, burden of family duties, including maternity leave, child care, and elder care, um, difficulties in achieving work-life balance. Uh, most of you know that I talked about my second job maybe yesterday, that you come home and you have like a whole other job. Um, and we used to joke, my husband and I, when we were little and my children are listening today, so I'm a little nervous, but I would look forward to Monday because my kids would be taken care of. They'd be in school or childcare. And I only had one thing to focus on, which was my career. And I think we're also as women frequently called on to service internally, whether it's a committee or a task force, um, you know, there's an interest in keeping us involved and, in, and, in, and, and since we're also in more junior positions, we tend to get assigned to committees. And, and a colleague of mine said, let's be careful about death by committee. Um, we've talked about the lack of retention, which I think is important, uh, the lack of institutional engagement. This has not been a priority for many academic centers. It is now. And maybe this lack of a sense of belonging. And we talked a little bit yesterday about imposter syndrome. You know, am I worthy? And I think that this is both a cultural issue, and I sent you all a paper yesterday, but also not so much 
us being, you know, that we need the therapy, but that the institutions we're working in need to start recognizing these differences in our lifestyle. Uh, important in, in promotion, though, is productivity. You have to have, there's certain things that you have to have in order to be, pr to be promoted. And I'm on, I'm the co-chair this year of our P&T committee and internally in, in the department. And so I sort of give the facts as they are, but here's some interesting data that really over the last 20 years, female authorship rose to almost 40%, but these publication rates have really plateaued over the last several years and are well below those of men. Um, the Nature Editorial Board wrote this very pointed editorial about manuscripts from female authors are accepted at a lower rate, although they didn't really give any particular action items. Um, first and senior authorship, which is where that, which is in part a very important part of your promotion, um, not just this H index and citations, but when the 10 Lancet journals, as well as science looked, only about a third of their papers have female primary authorship, either first or senior. And this is very recent. I mean, this was published really in the last two years. When we think about commission papers like invited editorials, viewpoints, um, you know, and the na Nature and Lancet noted that in 2017 and 2018, only 30% of their invited papers were from, were from women, um, which was up from about 20% in 2007. And, and I would argue that there are probably plenty of women that could have written these fantastic viewpoints, um, uh, but they were not invited. And indeed, most of us know, and I think the American Journal of Transplant has done a better job, that peer review process tends to be male dominated. Um, and in fact, none of the most influential in science journals has had female representation above an even close to 30%. It's about 28%. Most are close to about 17%. Um, and male domination of the process really reflects this commission papers because the, the editors in chief typically will come to their deputies and ask for someone to be invited. This is not related to women saying, I'm too busy and I can't do it. Another important aspect of productivity is grant funding. And Lord knows that we know this. This is what institutions really thrive on is NIH grant funding. And this is a great paper by uh, a group of investigators and program managers and officers in NIGMS uh, published in 2018, indicating that uh, in reviewing 35,000 funded NIH projects over about a 20 year, uh, about a 20 year period, only 30% of the grantees were women. Um, and women had submitted fewer applications and had slightly lower funding longevity as shown here. Now this paper is clever. They put the women in blue and the men in red, so don't get excited. Um, but the women, as you can see here, are significantly less likely to go on. And this is again, another Kaplan-Meier looking at the likelihood of sustained funding. And I thought there were some in interesting trends in new applications. Women are, there are fewer women applications per year, even as the decades go on and the numbers increase. Um, the funding rates, interestingly, over the last couple of years, however, are positive because they're similar. But there's this disparate, this, this, this uncomfortable feeling I have about renewals, that the, the percent of renewals, the, the applications and renewals for women are going down. And you can see the, the medians shown here. And the rates of funding are, get significantly lower, although in the last five years, they seem improved. So there was a sense here that not only are women putting in less applications, but they're less likely to be successful when they do get renewed later in their career. Um, this was another, this is a number of data of uh, different uh, papers that I summarized, but this was a table from um, the JAMA paper by Oliveira, Lo Oliveira that's a typo, uh, looking at the funding um, total funds, uh, demonstrating that women, when they're funded, even for some of these larger grants like a P50, tend to get funded at a lower, you know, lower amount of funds. And I don't know if we're just better economically, like we think that way, or we don't ask for more. Um, and interestingly, in looking at um, KO8s and K23s, which are usually the first kind of academic grant from NIH, um, about half of KO8s went to women and about 40% went to um, of the K23. So a little bit, again, still lower than men with a gap strata and total amount of funding of about almost uh, more than half a million dollars. So. There are other recognitions that are important in promotion. Um, many of us now know the term mantles. Um, this is a panel of men. And uh, again, it's been recognized by a number of sources that have been quoted that women are less frequently invited to present at elite meetings. And it's been suggested that when women are on organizing committees, this is less likely to happen. And indeed, I remember a recent national meeting where the, the organizing group was all men. And there were certainly presentations, and, th and this is just in the last year, where women could have given those talks and they just really didn't think about it. I think they just thought it was okay. 
I, awards are very important, whether they're internal, societal, or internal awards. Um, there's disproportionately fewer women that have been nominated. And so my organization, Women in Transplant, is really sort of have a, has a focus in this area of making sure we, we nominate women that we know are deserving. And interestingly, the Nobel Prize in Wet Medicine has only had two women awarded, which I find actually uh, striking. And another area of recognition is societal leadership. Now, granted, this is an election, but it's also people recognizing you as a leader. And when you look back at the American side of nephrology, we only had two prior presidents out of 66. This year is our third woman president. And I can assure you that in the society, there are some very strong women who have finally made it to council. Um, and so these are important recognitions that when you have them on your resume, on your CV, they lead to your promotion. So I, and the last thing, and I think this really gets into some of the retention and some of the issues of, of discomfort is what I call show me the money. And, you know, Jerry Maguire was so, you know, focused on making sure that his, his, uh, his, his athletes were getting funded. And so, uh, you know, I find some of these numbers quite striking. This is a, a, a survey of 24 state medical schools because they have public uh, salaries that are reported, 10,000 faculty shown here. If you look at un unadjusted median salary, women were significantly lower than men by nearly 50,000. If you go ahead and adjust for faculty rank, because we have to understand that salaries are pegged to your rank and, and to your whether you're tenured and if you're having any leadership. So when they tried to adjust for these variances, there was still a significant reduction of about 20,000. And shown here are the different medical schools. They all go nameless. Um, we're probably one of them. Um, I'm hoping we're the one of the ones over here where the differences between men and women's salaries were not. But you can see a few centers actually had women that were more highly funded, but the vast majority indicated salaries of men were significantly higher than salaries of women, even when they were adjusted. And again, the Amer this isn't just state, you know, this is not just state salaries, but the American College of Physicians has like a survey group that is willing to do surveys. Um, and they were representative of the American College of Physicians. They did a survey a few years ago, um, only about 54% of respondents um, uh, for this survey. And, and I'm shocked that it was that low. I think I would have been more strident and done it. But um, in their uh, representation, they felt that their respondents were representative of their membership. And importantly, the median annual salary was for men was $50,000 higher than for women indicating that women earned about 80 cents for every dollar for a man. And when I read this, I kind of got annoyed because I thought, God, I worked so hard. This just doesn't seem fair. And it reminded me of, of some of, our, sal of our, our factory workers where women you know, should be getting the same salary. There were clear gender differences, I'll have to say, in this survey um, across the demographics and, and different employment indicators. Um, and you can look a little bit further into this publication as well looking at hospital medicine salaries versus general internal medicine versus other specialties. But the trends were very similar when, when even when they were apparent, women were still getting paid significantly less than men. Um, and, you know, so you might argue, well, they can't really control for everything. So, uh, you know, let's look at, so another way of looking at this is let's look at the salary at the top. So I always think of the Department of Medicine as the top position. And that's really, in my training, the position we respected substantially. We weren't thinking about deans and, and associate deans and chancellors. We, we were driven, and I still do, look at my department chair as my leader. So in this survey of about 550 chairs, again, from US public medical schools, 29, this included a survey of about 1,000 individuals. Um, I'll note, and I'll show this again, that only 17% of these individuals, only 70% of chairs right now in the US are women. And if you looked at the mean unadjusted salary, they were significantly higher in men, 450,000 versus women. Um, and they looked at, at different adjustments for these, but again, women making about 85, 75 to 85 cents per dollar that a man would as a department chair. And so I think you can't really argue with me that this is an issue of quality of work or substance of work or body of work. I mean, a chair is a chair. They're doing a lot and they have, there's an expectation of their leadership and indeed Mensa, um, their comment, and this is this past year, said, our findings suggest that structural rather than individual solutions are needed to achieve sex salary equity. So um, how do we move forward and how is there, you know, how do you fix the salary gap? Well, I, I, I'm not going to be able to do this solely, but thankfully the Society of General Internal Medicine has a Women's in Medicine Commission, and this was published this past year. 
um, taught, giving some steps about how to standardize professional effort. Again, this is going to be tough because every institution is built differently. Uh, how, and I've learned that, you know, the easy and hard way, but our missions of education, research, and clinical care, many of you now do have component salaries. When I started out, it was one salary and nobody really told you how it was broken down. And you didn't know what was coming from the VA. And you didn't really get your BA bonus. It was all kind of convoluted. And many of you have bonuses too. And so it's really hard to know where that bonus fits in. Is that my whole salary, my part salary? Am I guaranteed or not? And so we need to identify appropriate compensation benchmarks and we need to apply them consistently with metrics across departments and divisions. And if you think that it's contentious within your own division, some are procedural and some aren't, you can imagine us crossing departments and hearing other department chairs say, well, my department is more important. We're generating more income. And so we have to sort of get group input to do this um, because it's just got, it's got to change. Um, you know, monitoring gender metrics pertaining to full-time equity, you know, equivalents and understanding that some women may split out and be part-time and assessing the impact on total compensation and making sure that women, I think this is most important, that there are women physicians involved in the decision-making that we're incorporating their voices and recognizing that they're important in how our organization functions. So as I harped on a little bit about leadership, I think leadership does count. And I have to say that I was somewhat disappointed by these numbers. I mean, the AAMC report makes everything look good because it says, well, it's better, but it's not better enough as far as I'm concerned. So this is the sex distribution of division and section chiefs. Uh, if across the US, 30% uh, are women compared to 70% of men. And again, the highlight of this is that it's up substantially from you know, 10 or 12 years ago. Um, and shown here in the department chairs, the, the most frequent women are found in anatomy departments and family practice departments and OBGYN, despite the fact that 80% of faculty are women in OBGYN, they're run by, the vast majority are run by men. So ponder that. Um, and looking here at internal medicine, 17.7, uh, so 18% of departments are run by women. Um, and this is up a little bit, you know, significant from 13% about 10 years ago. So, you know, our leadership is improving and, and more women are being represented. And I think, you know, it's hard because I have a, I'm talking to a department where there's a male department chair, but, you know, recognizing the ability of women to be part of the leadership and engage other women and, and serve, whether it's role models or just helping with recognition. Someone else said this, but not, and probably more with more strident and, and more um, and more articulate was uh, Reshma Jaxi from the University of Michigan, a, a very um, successful radiation oncologist, basic scientist, clinical scientist in her editorial to the New England Journal. And she looked at, a sur she surveyed the number of medical school deans shown in orange and department chairs over the last three decades and um, calculated that at the current rate um, we will take us 50 years to equity. Now, some of you will still be around by then, but I should hope I will, I don't think I'll be necessarily around, but I'll certainly be well into retirement. And, and highlighting that, that part of the problem that they felt is represented was term length, that the average term length of these leaders is about uh, almost nine years for men, a little lower for women, significantly lower, only about six years. And this paper really suggested enacting term limits. This is perhaps an underused mechanism and highlighting its ability to bring in new, fresh ideas. Now you can't keep swapping out department chairs every three years uh, or like presidents. I mean, I think you, it takes time to enact change and it takes time for a new chair to implement his or her thoughts. So, you know, I don't think you can get this down a whole lot lower, but maybe, um, you know, setting a term definitely under 10 years. I mean, when I came through training 10, 15, 20, I mean, one chair of surgery was there for 25 years. Um, I want to point out that I'm excited to see that associate and assistant deans are, are more and more women, and those distributions are shown here in purple. But I also want to point out that, you know, what are, what are women getting to do? They're in, you know, the Office of Diversity and Equity Initiatives. They're faculty affairs deans and student affairs deans. Um, not as many. I mean, the, the vast majority of, of deans that are involved in research and clinical health affairs continue to be men. The minority continue to be women. And my question is, is, well, why does this have to be? Why isn't this 50-50? Um, because I think we have many talented clinicians and many talented scientists. And again, it, you know, making leadership equivalent would certainly, I think, improve some of the issues we have. Now, I'm gonna touch a little bit upon mentorship. Um, 
you know, I, I talk a lot about mentorship in my career here. Um, it's important and it has an influence both on personal development, on career guidance, and maybe your career choice. Um, it helps with research productivity. I think it's really important because that sort of knowledge base and uh, that individual, though they may be older, has a lot of knowledge to, to serve in terms of which way your work is heading and, and whether, whether what journal to submit it to. It, it, a mentor helps you understand the cultural best practices of your organization. They're probably critical for promotion, especially when you're developing regional or local expertise and national expertise. They can reach out to their other colleagues and network on your behalf uh, as well. And they can help you network. And they also alleviate the barriers of entry. They can push down some of those barriers or get them out of the way, providing you uh, resources that you may not otherwise have access to. And there's lots of different ways of having mentors. Um, so I just want to point out this paper because this, this is where social media really helps. This was a, a recent paper by Al Shebley and colleagues from uh, NYU um, affiliate um, in, in um, the Middle East. And they took um, Microsoft academic graph data. They used some what they call powerful statistics. They compared male proteges to female proteges. Darker red is not good. Um, they noticed that there was a 35% reduction in mentorship outcome for women versus men. So when females had female protégés, they were less likely to be productive. That's why it's darker red. And that um, when female mentors had female, this is just females, but if, if female mentors um, had females as their mentees, they were more, they were less productive than men. And so they they kind of stridently said, well, we think that the same gender mentorship should go. And it's really opposite gender mentorship, primarily males um, mentoring females. And this was published in the, in the prominent Nature Communication. So this paper started getting tagged by STEM, women in medicine, kind of came to me, I pushed back. And uh, interestingly, um, just a couple of months ago, the editors retracted this paper. They said, quote, we were alerted that the subject is criticism to be considered by the editors. I wish I personally, as an editor, was shocked that it even got as far as it did. There was no editorial and there was no comment if it, it just got sort of thrown in. The criticisms were targeted to the author's interpretation of their data that gender plays a role in success of mentoring between junior and senior investigators and we're investigating these concerns and we'll follow up with an editorial on the resolution. Now, I haven't seen any additional resolution. I could not understand their statistics at all. Um, because it involved, there was a calculus and a limit, and I was like, okay. Um, but I did think it was sort of a disturbing message. And so I'm glad to see that finally a further examination of the data, which should have happened through peer review, which should have happened by the associate editor or deputy editor of this journal. It shouldn't have had to come to social media. So and, um, another concept is what's called sponsorship. And I realize I may not have had great mentors, but I had some good sponsors in my life. And these are really individuals that advocate for you. They advance your position, especially when you're promising. And, and mentors aren't necessarily sponsors. Um, this really goes beyond mentorship. And this is really networking. This is really where someone well-placed in an organization typically can help somebody um, in another uh, area. And it doesn't necessarily have to be on a regular basis. Like my mentees, we try to meet regularly um, to go over what they're doing, but this could be something that's intermittent. And, and a couple of my sponsors aren't even on my campus. They're in other organizations. And a recent structured survey at Hopkins um, uh, highlighted here in reference to an academic medicine surveyed um, that successful sponsorship was really important in their organization for academic progression. And unfortunately, there wasn't a good figure to show you that, but um, it identified that having these sort of connections were really uh, important, particularly for women uh, in developing their careers. So we do have this organization, Women in Transplant. I'm the current chair, uh, and these are my that Beth Foster is my co-chair. We're from around the world. Our goal is to advance and inspire women transplant professionals. We champion issues of sex and gender. This organization was really started in 2005 by the first woman president of the Transplantation Society and International Society. It took them like 30 years to get their first woman, and uh, it's. I think they're, um, it just was pretty shocking because the woman was this very well-known Catherine Wood, a basic scientist. And, our, and the vision that we, we developed in, uh, is worldwide gender equity and inclusiveness in transplant. But it's two aspects. It's one is advancing, inspiring women professionals. So one pillar that's really devoted to networking, education, supporting each other, both through formal, informal mentorship and sponsorship. 
keeping an eye on programming, suggesting programs where women can speak in basic science topics that doesn't have to necessarily be about gender and sex, um, and also supporting and advocating. And indeed, this year I was able to secure um, $200,000 from industry to provide to two junior faculty to develop uh, trainees to develop a grant funding for women to study the issues of sex and gender and transplant, both basic and clinical. And then we have a second pillar that's involved in actual research, um, again, working with me to develop more sustainable funding for these projects, designating sessions and national and international meetings. And we have an advocacy piece where we're trying to reduce disparities for the number of female and living donors, uh, female donors in, in, in Southeast Asia way outweigh uh, male donors. So there's some significant disparities um, and also, but, but there's more male recipients and this is a distribution that's disparate to the actual incidence of disease. So my last few slides, COVID, what hasn't COVID affected? And, and I keep trying, this is a slide from my medical grand rounds, which was a summary of all the things that had happened to solid organ transplantation, but COVID has had a significant impact on the workforce, as you know, and a disproportionate impact on women and those of color. Um, in September of 2020, there were almost a million women that had left the workforce, which accounted for almost 80% of job losses. And a quarter of women that used Department of Labor survey said there was another quarter of uh, about a fourth of women were considering reducing or leaving workforce. I have colleagues here that you know, left and, and took an, uh, a leave of absence because of young children or parental care where they just couldn't really be working two jobs anymore. And, and, and also putting that with the social distancing aspect and inability to access services. And I think women honestly have been uh, proportionally affected. Um, my children are grown up. I did have a college student coming home unexpectedly, but I didn't have to worry about her logging in. But if I had a six or an eight year old or a 10 year old, not my dogs, I mean, really focusing on this, I, I would have been really distracting and really difficult. And we're people of means. We have you know, we have Wi-Fi that usually works. We have, you know, a comfortable home situation, but uh, Laura, uh, Linda Brubaker wrote a really nice editorial piece, a viewpoint piece in JAMA this past year. I'd urge you to read it as a woman talking about many of these um, uh, societal issues and the impact of women physicians. Um, again, another invited commentary here in JAMA Open Network and, and a couple of summary points. One is, you know, clinical trial primary investigators, you know, why only less than 30% of the COVID-19 principal investigators for trials were women. When you look at things like cancer studies, like breast cancer studies, where more than half of the PIs are women, 42% um, for type 2 diabetes trials. I mean, why did this happen? And, you know, were, were women overlooked or were women too busy? Uh, you know, I don't know that answer, but it seems that um, a, an opportunity that may be admissed. I think clearly productivity is affected um, because of childcare duties, because of other alternative issues. And another problem is this whole online meeting thing. You know, I think that we, when you pack up and go away to a meeting, there's an expectation that you have a solid childcare plan or the meeting provides a childcare plan for you. But an online meeting, and I'll be honest, I've really been a poor attendee of my own online meetings that I am supposed to be participating in because I'm pulled in a million directions. And I think there are many competing interests. And the other you know, undue negative of this is the loss of networking. I think for junior faculty, the networking is important. And I, you know, believe it or not, I was a kind of a shy person in the beginning of my career. And my, my mentor then made me go to these poster sessions. I put up my poster and I'd go, oh, who's going to come up and how annoying. But I realized that the person to the right, right and to my left was feeling the same way. And I got to know two really fantastic colleagues, David Rothstein and Tony Jevnikar, by standing by a ridiculous poster that I felt very uncomfortable with. So I think networking is really critical. Publications by women first authors fell significantly during 29, uh, from 2019 levels. This is over the past year. There's, um, I summarize a number of papers, but um, when you look at med archive and bio archive, those sort of preprints, that was, there was a gap there as well. And then if you look at you know, countries like Africa, they had the lowest women's rate. This is first authorship was down by 14%, male authorship, uh, last author five, um, and then the full group about 5%, that women weren't even on some papers at all. Um, and COVID-19 papers have really fewer women um, than papers published from 2019. Um, there were about 16,000 papers published in, that, uh, in just a six month period. I can assure you as a deputy editor, uh, my number of reviews went up 
skyrocketed from COVID-19. And not all my papers were about COVID, it was about everything else. And so I don't know if people were just home typing more and thinking more and, and getting out old research. Um, I think Crystal Lentine made a significant uh, impact here on these COVID-19 authorship papers, because Lord knows we wrote a bunch together as well to try to keep the numbers up for women. So I know COVID-19 is horrible. And, and so uh, this is a, a really nice piece in academic medicine, um, you know, saying that maybe this is the wake up call. You know, we, we had terrible things in the summer where we had these wake up calls about disparities in, in, for individuals of color. Well, maybe this is the wake up call, uh, COVID-19 to catalyze significant sociopolitical and cultural changes from which academic medicine has not been exempt. And you know, Nicole goes on to write, rather than potentially disadvantaging women in the biomedical community, this pandemic can bring awareness and implementation of more balanced domestic burdens, academic support, and sustained institutional and, uh, efforts around gender equity. Uh, and so just so you don't think that you know, this is just relevant to academia, but the Biden administration, and this was in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago, has now authorized and created the new Gender Policy Council It'll be located in the White House. This is Hillary Clinton's um, uh, comments about the council, um, but these are two really nice articles. This council will has two women leaders that have been involved in, in women's uh, gender equity around the world and, and locally. Um, they'll be on the Council of Economic Advisors and in the Defense Department. So they're gonna have like a real role. It's not just women talking about, you know, things aren't good. Um, they'll collaborate with agencies. They're charged with actually doing these they will be focusing on the impact of COVID-19, issues of national security, health, economics, uh, healthcare and economics as well. Um, the NIH has been involved. Many of you recognize Frances Collins, but maybe you don't recognize her. Well, who is her? Her is Dr. Collins. She's a nephrologist in private practice in the, in the Boston, Massachusetts area. And she was uh, attended uh, the Women in Nephrology uh, meeting. She actually said they actually did a, a whole discussion about gender equity, but you know she had very significant issues onboarding her career and who had to hear about it. Her father and I think having this kind of relationship really woke him up to being a really uh, a supporter of women. Mantles the recognition of women and sex and gender as an outcome variable in our research and answering to that. And under his guidance now there are ten of twenty seven institutes are finally women. Uh, shown here, some in very prominent positions. Um, this is the Dental Research uh, Institute, um, and not just gender equity positions, but really one with the institutes with teeth. I will point out that intramural leadership, and I was part of the intramural program, has always lagged. It's an extraordinarily male-dominated leadership at NIH, but under Dr. Collins' recommendation, there will now be 12-year term limits for lab and branch chiefs. So lab chiefs are, are more of a basic science organizational structure, Branch chiefs are more of a clinical. So I was in the uh, the transplantation branch under Alan Kirk, and if we had stayed, he would be you know out and had to move on. Um, there are also national efforts. This is another nice paper by Renee Butkets by the American College of Physicians and Achieving Gender Equity. These publications are all from the last couple of years, and shown here is a screenshot from last week. Uh, our institution created a gender equity community of practice. This screen has twice as many people, but I couldn't fit them on, really focusing on some of the aspects across campus, all positions in terms of career advancement, work-life balance, um, and what the big asks are. Are there solutions? A great paper, we won't have time, by Trico and colleagues in the, in the Canadian Medical uh, Journal. Um, and I put these up just to highlight that there is a strong emphasis on behavioral and systemic changes that are needed. And then a recognition of career flexibility um, creating, you know, advancing our mentorship and sponsorship uh, activities, as well as, you know, making sure we have resources um, and support, including non-gendered parental leave schemes. So what about me? Um, you saw many of these pictures. I had some amazing role models. I want to point out my department chair, uh, who passed away this year from multiple medical uh, issues, Joe Greenfield. I have a picture above a bookcase overlooking me right now that I can see, and I, I think of him a lot. I, I, I met him a couple of years ago before we knew he wasn't doing well, he was getting more frail. And I said to him, I hope I didn't disappoint you. And he was overwhelmed emotionally that I said that. His program director, my colleague, Ralph Corey, I was chief resident, they picked me, I pushed back. I said, ah, I don't wanna be just like a woman, you know, you know. And, and he called me in the office and really got mad. And he said, well, I don't know what you're thinking. Girl, we need women out there. And I know you can stand up to those surgeons, woo, woo. 
And it's true. I mean, he really trained me. He coached me and he was a great sponsor. Um, I've had, you know, amazing faculty opportunities in my research. And I've had an opportunity to be president of a national society, develop public policy and advocacy. I have had made mistakes. By the way, this is the other daughter who's also an amazing scholar athlete, not just the one over here. Um, but I think that to me, my family was really always very, very important. And as my mom said, when things get really bad, if you have the money, throw some money at your problem, get a cleaning lady to come in, get some, you know, buy some pre-prepared meals, don't make yourself crazy. Um, so uh, last thing, my last slide really is what advice would you give yourself? So last year, Nebraska Medicine had Women in Medicine Month and they grabbed some of these pictures that um, Krista showed you. Um, so in my post, I said, and this is probably my most liked Instagram post, I don't get a lot of likes on it. You know, my thoughts are really to take it easy on yourself. Um, you know, nobody said this career was going to be easy and no one said it was going to be a cakewalk. Um, I love it and I know many of you do too. There are champions out there, but you have to find them. And sometimes that's difficult and you need help finding those people. And, you know, as a person, you continue to evolve. I'm really not the same person I was in this picture, that's for sure. Um, and in some ways that makes life very exciting. I, you know, you have an opportunity to change and advance your career. And with that, I wanna just thank, um, these are my many collaborators. You see, I'm involved in a lot of consortia. I think consortia are really critical. They increase your productivity. They allow networking and they give you new ideas. And with that, I'll stop and take, if we have time, I'll take some questions. Well, we are definitely going to have a discussion. So thank you, Dr. Mannon, so much for that very insightful presentation and analysis and really encourage folks to um, unmute, have a conversation. But we have a question from Dr. Kevin Martin, who is our um, longtime division chief of nephrology. And he would like to know how you balance diversity of all types, um, gender or racial with equal opportunity. So I'm not sure I know exactly how to answer that. Um, I'm certainly not an expert. I, I, I think I lead a lot from my heart. Um, there are some amazing people out there and we just have to get to know who they are. And this isn't saying I'm not gonna take, you know, I, I understand it. I, um, I have a nephew who hasn't gotten into medical school and I can see that he's getting more and more angry about it. Um, but I think there's an opportunity to, to look around our communities and see who's there. Look at these medical students in your own community. Are there people that we can engage, particularly in nephrology? Um, can you bring them to the fore and get them motivated to be part of our, of our community? Um, but, uh, and again, you know, people of color have confided in me. They don't wanna just be picked up because they're people of color. And the people that I know that have been on faculty of color are really amazing. In fact, Janice Marcelin is our grand round speaker today, a, a junior faculty member in ID talking about diversity and equity. Um, and I think that's really important that there are excellent and outstanding people that we need to be thinking about. And I think, you know, there was uh, Men in Black Coats is a new, um, is a new documentary and there's a new drive by men to, and that, are, that are black to try to get more male medical students because that's a population that's very small right now there and it's very limited and you're not gonna be able to get racial equity on faculty because of that, um, because the numbers are so small. So you have to just say, oh, I'm gonna make everybody 50%. I think you have to see what the population is that you're derived from. Thank you, Dr. Manning. Um, Dr. Philip Neri, one of our nephrologists would like to know if you, how do you feel that excellence in patient care um, in, in service should be balanced versus grant funding, rewards for grant funding and publication? So, you know, when I started out, everybody was on one track, track of success. And there were these triple threats and, and you know, that, was, that meant an, an individual successful in education, research and clinical care. And that was great in the 1970s. And as my department chair, Joe Greenfield would say, well, you know, I do one experiment and I got an NIH grant. That's not the way it works. So many institutions have different tracks. And I think the most important thing is I have incredible success for my clinicians or our clinicians because I'm able to do the clinical research because our clinical care is so successful. So every department does it a little different, um, but I have profound respect to clinicians, especially when they know something and I have to go look it up and up today. And I'm like, how do you know that? Um, but I think clinical care is important and it is the bedrock of who we are. But I also wanna point out that as a clinician at an academic center, I expect you to translate what your, your findings, a, famous, a, fa a great case, a review, a quality project, I'd like to see that published because you have a unique perspective. And I think 
clinicians have that opportunity still in, a, in, in as academics. And education is unbelievably critical right now, getting people to stay involved and stay in areas, rural healthcare, geriatrics, uh, psych, those kinds of things where there's really struggles. Thank you, Dr. Mann. And well, um, Dr. Uh, Christine Jacobs, who is our acting dean, has a question regarding um, successful mentoring programs for medical schools and for faculty. So I don't know much about what medical schools are doing. And in fact, my, you know, I'm from three decades ago, so they sort of like three in the water and no life preserver, good luck. I mean, we had big sibs and that really helped. I had somebody senior to me that I could always go to. In fact, I still reach out to him on a personal basis uh, just to hear what he's doing. He went into plastic surgery and trauma. Could, couldn't have been anything different than me. Um, but you know, we have active mentorship programs here at our institution. At my previous institution, we did as well. You know, we, we hate assigning people someone. We hope to give it more open opportunity. And I think critical to faculty development is, is assessing your goals. And so um, we, we have an associate uh, 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 chair of, in, in um, sort of faculty development who's created some really nice online resources that are actually available to the public where she's really emphasized and I've learned from her setting goals. I mean, like I just sort of hopped out of residency and started on this track. I, I, I didn't know how to set goals. I mean, nobody talked to me that way. I, I wish I had, maybe I wouldn't have spun my wheels, but you know, this is an opportunity where people can sit down and create what they're thinking and, and you know, reach out to a mentor or talk to their chair or division chief about a mentor that might fit well or suit them to sit down. And, and I said, you know, I actually have a weekly meeting with one mentee and we set it, it's in stone. Um, We've actually had classes at UAB about how to be a mentor, which is sometimes missing because people don't know. And I think that really helps, you know, codify this relationship. And sometimes you don't like your mentee or your mentee doesn't like you. Um, and that's fine. They, they can have two or three mentors. I mean, I'm fine with dyads. I, I mentored someone at UAB who had a long distance mentor and I never dealt with that mentor. I just dealt with the mentee. And so there's a lot of models that we have available that people should be, I think people can be open to. Well, that's wonderful. And actually, there's a number of questions about specific resources, materials, and so I'm going to be following up with you for resources to, to share. Um, Dr. Matt Broom, who's also one of our leaders at the university, wonders about models for term limits for directors or chiefs with the idea of developing um, mentoring and succession planning and incorporating diversity within that. Yeah, so I think that's kind of a newer concept. I mean, it's not one that I've heard bandied about, at least certainly not here yet. Um, but I think it's important to bring in new ideas and to, you know, I, I'm marveling about the past of how people retain power for so long and guided a division and a department in particular for so long. But I, I don't know if there are specific recommendations. I have some resources that I've looked at, but I haven't really focused on it. I, I was very struck and, and very, uh, you know, I felt so grateful to um, Francis Collins for doing the intramural because one of the reasons I left, you know, NIH is there, there was no future. I, a colleague of mine actually put it out to me five years earlier. I had just gotten there in three years. He says, well, what's your future? Like, what do you become? Where do you go? What's the hierarchy? What do you want to achieve? There were opportunities, but it, it just, the, the organizational structure there is very rigid and it's great to see that they're thinking about it as well. So I didn't give you a great answer, um, but I think this is again, something that institutions now are starting to look at. Kind of continuing some of the themes that have come up, do you think there should be any attention to revising the traditional criteria for advancement? to um, promote more yeah, equity you know, sitting, I don't know if I'll make much of an impact because I'm only on the Department of Medicine Committee Chair, which is sort of the gatekeeper to the, to the institution. Um, and I think that, that with this, our gender and equity initiative, uh, one of my components that I'm focusing on is promotion and tenure. And because some of these criteria don't fit anymore, um, some of the criteria, especially for people that are almost full-time clinicians, um, it's just very difficult for them to do the service. Sometimes it's easier for them to do the service, whereas the research people aren't doing enough. And a real critical problem is basic science PhDs, where some institutions are asking them to fund 80% of their salary through grants. Grants are tough to get right now. Is that really make sense? They've got to teach. I mean, it's not, it's not a party life. You know, I, I, as a clinician scientist said, oh, they're just sitting around thinking. And then we, you come by to meet with them for coffee and back before the COVID. 
Um, but they're not in their office because they're out teaching, they're out doing a course, they're um, in the lab showing a junior person how to do a technique. So I, I do think it's time to do that and we're gonna start doing that here. Awesome. What do you think about the value of mentorship within institutions versus across institutions? And how should folks balance pursuing their, their, their mentors? Should it be you know, senior so mentors, peer I, mentors? Yeah. yeah, I think I get what you're saying. So I think, um, so fundamentally, it's important to have your mentor and or a sponsor at your own institution, fundamentally. And if you can't find a mentor and you've tried and tried, maybe it isn't the greatest place for you. Maybe it's just not the right fit. But I also think that 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 part of the success, my standing by a poster, a dorky, very junior person standing to more senior people. I mean, David and Tony were much more advanced in their career was the fact that they bothered to talk with me as well. And, and, and having these sort of informal mentors and guides. Now, I don't spend as much time with David Rothstein, but Tony Jevnikar has been someone I've reached out to for scientific mentorship, for thoughts about experiments. I do the same thing with, a, with a, someone at Cleveland Clinic named Rob Fairchild, where we share data, we look and we hear about things. Um, and I keep, I really have external people I reach out to. They're not all women. In fact, most of my mentors weren't women because there weren't a lot of women when I came through, there were a few. And, and they were busy. And, and I had a colleague, Nancy Allen, who was one of the few professors eventually of, of medicine. And she was just a great role model to see her zipping around and, and, and we have a lot of informal discussions. So I'm a strong proponent of saying, you gotta have somebody at home, but it's great to have people outside the institution if they can help you. Awesome. Dr. Mann, uh, I would like to piggyback on that particular question. Okay. and. Um, so I keep telling uh, many people that you may not be able to find only one mentor for your growth. You may have to have different mentor for different aspects. So you may need a mentor for academic growth or a leadership skills or for lab science or clinical trials. So you, you may need different mentors. I don't think you can find like one mentor like Yoda to become a Jedi, you know. Right, right cause the Jedi council, there was a council of mentors, really. Um, I think that's a great point. So I, I think back to my days at UAB where a very junior colleague came to me. Yeah, you know, she had her mentorship. She had her mentor group scientifically, but she said, well, I need you here because I need to understand how the institution works. I need you because you have deeper insight into transplant than this person does. You have a different perspective. And so um, everybody has a different you know, reason how they serve, but, I, but it always helps to have one primary person because you need to share your joys and your failures with them or what you think is, yeah, Jedi Council. It is, a, it's a great point. Um, but you have to be able to have someone that you can come to and say, boy, my grant didn't even get reviewed. Now your mentor may not be the right person to look at it because they're going to be pissed off like you are. You're going to be very angry. So it's good to have somebody else at institution that, you know, hey, that person's a great grant writer. They do endothelial injury, but I do interstitial fibrosis but have somebody else, a third eyes, who can guide you and say, just take a deep breath. It's normal to be angry because I think, you know, peer, you know, I think some, we didn't get into peer review and implicit bias. I mean, there are a lot of things going on right now. And I think people are a little bit angrier. And, and sometimes I see in group discussions, people going down on, you know, getting down on an idea. And I'm like, why? Because you didn't think of it, you know? And sometimes that's what happens and you need, you need somebody like me to say it's because they you thought of it and it's a great idea and you need to pursue it but we got to make those science more robust i was thinking about transplantation as a, kind of a, a team a practice we actually have a number of attendees on here across di disciplines including pas nurse coordinators farm d's and any, any advice for those women as they're planning their advancement and seeking mentorship so I think one of the, the more difficult aspects of nursing now is this is, are the APPs. And I don't want to dissuade all of you that have your degrees and are helping, you know, be physician extenders because, you know, in the olden days, there was a leadership of nursing. And so APPs, when they were added in, in every institution, they're either under nursing, they're under hospital administration, they're under the department, the division. And I think that when, what happens is if, they sort of, you know, one of my little mini projects on the side for our leadership, uh, Health Leadership Academy at UAB was to help define why were we losing so many nurses? And we were finding that women were coming, men too, but mostly women getting their advanced practice and they were leaving for better jobs. And so 
We tried to find out what the issue was. And for many APPs, they felt dispossessed. They weren't nurses. They weren't doctors. They, they weren't really getting the love and they weren't getting any career or professional development at, our, at, at that institution. And I see, I mean, I don't wanna knock where I was or where I am now, but I, I don't see that happening. And so there is like a council here, or a, 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 a work group that works of all APPs working with the hospital administration because they need professional development. And certainly in transplant, we've developed courses now annually where they can get appropriate training because for many years, our APPs had to go to like diabetes meetings and cardiology meetings to get credits for, for continuing education for their licenses. Exactly oh. right. Uh, any folks want to unmute and ask Dr. Manon a, you know, a live Angie, question? Angie Nishio, <laughs> oh, hey Angie. Sure. Um, oh, good, good, sorry. She asked a question about peer mentorship. So I think um, we didn't get into that in these slides and I think the assumption is it's somebody senior. I think peer mentors are great. So who's my peer mentor? It's it's probably my spouse. And in fact, when I drive home, I mentioned this yesterday, I have to like chill. I put on some music and I just drive and, and I wish the drive was a little bit longer so I don't come in the house and vomit the day out and say, whoa, 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 whoa because um, I forget to tell him the good things. I tell him the bad things and or the things that annoy me. And so my peer mentor has been my spouse, but, uh, but in all seriousness, it's been um, having people that are around you that are going through the same experience are really critical. And maybe they've already overcome a barrier in your division or department and, and you can share it, or maybe something just doesn't seem right. Or and, and I think having peers to talk about these things are really important. So I have a lot of peer mentors outside. Like I bounce things off Dr. Lentine all the time with this one grant we're on that we find quite painful. Um, but, but, you know, just to sort of say, am I wrong? Like, am I getting, and it's, it's good to have that sort of self you know, not actualization, but just a realization that you're on point. Sometimes it may be, you know, if you think this is fair, you need an objective person that's not upset and wound up to help you. And especially as you're starting off in your career, it really helps to have people, you know, the power of many. Um, it, it really helps. I think it always helped me quite a bit. That is absolutely wonderful. Again, Roz, we are definitely going to be following up with you um, regarding some specific materials and resources that you can share because folks are interested in that. Um, with regard to your time, Dr. Nayak, any parting comments or conclusions? You're muted, sir. So I would like to ask on the behalf of our trainees, do you have any um, words for our trainees, female trainees, uh, residents, fellows? Who, you know, they're coming out in a much different era than in 1980s and 1990s. Dr. Mann, can you hear? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were waiting for them to say something. So um, <laughs> I, I, as I spoke to our trainees, coincidentally, I told you all I, we had our trainee panel last night about women, and it was really sort of fascinating. I mean, you know, I think there was a lot of discussion about um, negotiations and, and that really varies from what job you're doing, um, issues of recruitment and what to think about, you know, uh, you know, approaching faculty that you really like and admire. They may be clinical faculty and you want to do research and if they don't do research, they'll guide you to what you want to do. But I think you have to be able to speak up and feel comfortable to say, hey, I really enjoyed my rotation with you. I mean, look at Dr. Nyack's memory. I mean, I never had a memory like that of, of having my department chair see my, my research and, and recognize it. I would have been really, I, I think he knew I was busy, but um, I, I would be really touched by that. So I think reaching out to faculty and yeah. creating your network early because you're gonna be looking at positions soon and you may not choose to stay and you really need some advice. You need someone who's been through it to sort of help guide you. And it's more than just human resources, finding a financial plan or making sure, you know, talking to HR for this new job. Those are parts of the components of finding a new position. So on that point, Dr. Men, I still practice the medicine the way Dr. Fitch practiced and I, and I still grill my trainees the way he used to grill trainees. And um, I think that's the best way to learn traditional internal medicine. And, uh, if I would like to know if there are any more questions. Otherwise, I will see whether Dr. Fitch family has any comments or questions. I see them in the audience earlier. OK. All right. <laughs> I'm to say hello. I enjoyed this talk. 
And as a current MD PhD student, I just have to say that it's daunting looking at these facts and figures now for equity, for inclusion, but looking at the number of people who are on this call today, the number of people who um, have been asking questions, I also feel energized that there are individuals who are working towards being in positions of power that ultimately we're getting closer and closer and closer where we're going to start seeing some of these statistics that my mom presented today reverse. So I'm looking forward to this and it was a good talk. <laughs> Thank you, Ellie. Thank you. Dr. Kumar, you have a comment? I was just gonna say, it's always a pleasure, Roz. You have been an incredible mentor to me and so many of our faculty here at UAB. And just hearing you talk today again makes me us miss you so much, but thank you. This was brilliant. Right. Really an idea to put this on social media because I see many names of people. Megan Yannick was one of my mentees. I felt like maybe I failed her because she left Children's, <laughs> but I think she went on to find a position that she was happier with. Um, collaborators, some collaborators I see on as well, and, and a surprise to have my children on, one of whom is in, is in medical school, one is in graduate school right now. So I, that's really appreciative. Appreciate it. They wonder, I know they wondered what I was doing all that time when I was staying up at night and working when they went to bed. <laughs> yes. Come, yes, please. Yes. Hi, uh, Dr. Mann and Mrs. Jackie Fleckenstein. I'm one of uh, Coy and Rachel's daughters. Oh. I just wanted to thank you for that uh, great talk. Uh, I know that both would have enjoyed it immensely. Appreciate thank your you. perspective. I, um, it makes, I got a little, you know, a little emotional thinking about my department chair a, a few minutes ago. And, um, you know, it's so, I really appreciate the family allowing us to do this virtually. I know here we've had some endowed lectureships and the family has said, and no, we want them in person and we want to see the people. So I, I am grateful. And I'm, you know, I trained in that very difficult kind of atmosphere where people were peppering me with questions. And I was telling the house staff one time, you know, I really cried during my internship and a female colleague came up and gave me a hug and we sorted it out and I got back to work and um, got all my blood tubes ready and did everything. It's just, it's just really hard. Um, but I appreciate it. and I appreciate the commitments your family have made over the years. I mean, and all the trainees and success, the legacy here of seeing, um, you know, one of your father's mentees and, and you know, now the, his successor, it's pretty amazing to me. Thanks again. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Mann, and thanks everyone, both locally and just across the country for, for joining. It's been a wonderful event. Hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ross. All right, Dr. Lenti. <laughs>